Hi everyone, welcome to the annual Dalhousie Horrocks Leadership Lecture. My name is Vivian Howard and I'm the Acting Director of the School of Information Management at Dalhousie University. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we're located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. The Dalhousie Horrocks Leadership Lecture is a flagship event for our school and is a celebration in our discipline of leadership, recognizing both an outstanding current leader and a student who demonstrates enormous leadership potential. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that as acting director, I stepped into an event for which the planning was already well underway. Dr. Sandra Toes, SIM director, started the planning before she went on leave, and I've just stepped into her shoes. This is the first time that we've held the Horrocks Leadership Lecture virtually, so an extra amount of planning and coordination has been necessary. I'd like to acknowledge all the work done by Kim Humes, Janet Music, alumni officer Laurie Bold, students Alexis Wilkinson, Janet Kubke, Jacob Kubke, and tech wizard James Wilson. I probably left somebody out. If so, thank you for everything you've done. It really does take a village to mount a virtual event like this. Before we get started, I'd like to just mention a few housekeeping details. You can see over on the uh, right hand side, there is a chat bar. So if you have questions, please post them on the chat or in the chat on the right hand side and you can post those uh, during the lecture. If something occurs to you that you'd like to ask, please just post it there. When questions appear in the feed, you can upvote them with the thumbs up and I see that people already know how to do that because my welcome message has got 17 thumbs up, so that's great. So the more thumbs up, the higher priority the question will be given and that will help ensure that high priority questions get asked because we may not have time to get through all the questions. So that's a good way to vote for questions you'd really like to uh, have Jean answer. Um, if you would like closed captioning, there is a CC button that you can press to get the closed captioning. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our Dalhousie Horrocks Leadership Lecturer for this year, Jean Joseph. Dr. Jean Ann Joseph is of Wet'suwet'en and Nadlehuten ancestry and was the first Indigenous librarian in British Columbia to receive her Master's of Library Science degree in 1982. And when I read that, I realized that Jean and I were actually at UBC at the same time, but in different programs. I was doing an MA and she was doing her MLIS, but we were virtually a few yards apart from each other on the UBC campus, but we never met. As a professional librarian, she has specialized in First Nations Aboriginal title and rights litigation, as well as in establishing First Nations libraries and archival connect collections. Dr. Joseph was the founding librarian of the Huawei Library at the University of British Columbia the only post-secondary institution in Canada with an Indigenous library. In 1996, the University of British Columbia School of Library, Archival and Information Studies recognized Dr. Joseph's work with a Distinguished Alumni Award for Outstanding Contributions to Library and Information Services in Canada. In 2015, Dr. Joseph retired from White Raven Law where she worked for many years as a senior research and litigation support advisor on Haida Aboriginal title. In 2018, Dr. Joseph was honored by the Vancouver Island University with an honorary Doctor of Law degree. Dr. Joseph's leadership and innovation continues to provide a foundation for future generations of First Nations librarians, libraries, archives, and cultural centers. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jean Joseph.
Thank you. I'd like to first acknowledge that I'm living on the traditional and unceded territory of the Kwantlen First Nation. Thank you to the Dalhousie team for inviting me to this Horrocks lecture series. Thank you to the Horrocks family, as well as for providing this platform. Congratulations to the award recipient, Saban Huygens. My first reaction to this invitation was, but, but I'm retired. However, upon reflection, I realized that I still feel quite strongly about a few issues that I think have been ignored or is incomplete work in our profession. And particularly, I believe ignored academic and public libraries. It is our tradition to introduce ourselves by providing family background. My mother, Louise, is from Notley in North Central British Columbia. My late father, Walter Joseph, was from the village of Tsekia in Northwest British Columbia. My mother's parents were Notley Wetton hereditary chiefs. My father's mother was a Wet'suwet'en hereditary chief. Kim, the first slide, please. This first photograph is by my brother, Walter Joseph. The photo is of Stekioden, a mountain immediately south of our home village. Sekia is also known as Hegwoget. I'm from a family of 12 children. Most of my brothers and sisters obtained still fairly unique for people in our area to complete high school. The three things that made me agree to this lecture are matters which still need to be addressed by the library profession. They are number one, the language used to describe and name First Nations and Indigenous peoples. Number two, public library services to First Nations and Indigenous Canadians. And number three, training of First Nations and Indigenous peoples. I had originally planned on spending some time speaking of my work on the Delgamu Aboriginal title case. I'll just say it was one of the most difficult and challenging, but at the same time, most rewarding works that I undertook in my life as I was working Kim, the second slide, please. This map shows the Wet'suwet'en Nation's traditional territories. Hagwilget is on the northwest tip outside of Wet'suwet'en territory. The Kiksan Nation's territory is to the northwest of Wet'suwet'en territory. The Delgamuk Kistewe case went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. The 1997 decision has made major impact upon First Nations Aboriginal title and was the first to accept oral history as evidence. I worked from 1984 until 1992 on this case, organizing and cataloging thousands of documents, exhibits, transcripts, maps, recordings, and legal arguments. during trial and first appeal. My work on First Nations naming and subject headings began in 1978. After receiving my bachelor's degree, I was hired to work at the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, where I was fortunate to be mentored by professional librarian Frances McCall. She had re been recruited in 1976 and um, to take over the National Indian Brotherhood Library um, by Brian Deere. Brian was then the only First Nations person to graduate from library school in Canada. Brian developed the classification system during his two year tenure at the National Indian Brotherhood Library. Brian Deere left the profession in 1978 Ms. McCall 
brought this system to the Union of BC Indian Chiefs and adapted it to BC First Nations. Later, I adapted it and continue to adapt it for various libraries. With the Huihua Library at the Union of University of British Columbia being one of the better known libraries. Kim, the third slide, please. This is a photograph of me in 1980 at the Union of BC Indian Chiefs Resource Center. During library school, as with my undergraduate work, I based much of my research on First Nations. One research course resulted in my draft the source of Canadian Indian subject headings, which became a basis for my future work. I graduated in 1982 as the first First Nations person of Saskatchewan graduated the year before, so she is a second First Nations professional librarian in Canada. For a research paper in library school, I contacted First Nations organizations across Canada and compiled a list of subject headings from those lists. In all the libraries since then, I have added and adapted this list according to the specific needs of the First Nations culture and to the subjects covered in the various collections. As much of my work was intended for legal purposes, improving Aboriginal title and rights, the work and collections were private and confidential rather than in the public domain. The one collection that is open is the Huihua Library, which you use my subject headings. Both of these are living documents and as such need to be continually updated and revised as Indigenous peoples reclaim their languages and sovereignty around naming. While cataloging materials for these collections, I also realized that some of the methods outlined in the Anglo-American cataloging rules were colonial in nature, and I did not agree with them. Thus, I changed the level of importance of responsibility to ensure that First Nations authorities were recognized, especially when based on oral history from First Nations. When I began to work at the Huihua Library at UBC in 1992, I knew that the Library of Congress libraries, but I strongly felt that First Nations libraries needed to make a stand and bring forth our names, our authorities, and have them recognized. Therefore, as with previous libraries I had worked in, I used my revised BC Brian Deere classification and my subject headings, which emphasized using First Nations names as currently provided by themselves and terms for subjects as used by First Nations, rather than those used in Sears or Library of Congress. Kim, the fourth slide, please. Dr. Ann Doyle, Naming, Claiming and Recreating her 2013 doctoral thesis. In 1997, various personal and family responsibilities resigned from my tenured position as a University of BC librarian. I recommended Anne Doyle to Joanne Archibald, then director of the First Nations House of Learning and was seconded in 1997 and later in 2005, she applied for and was appointed head librarian. The Huihua Library became an official UBC library branch about the same time. It still is the only First Nations branch of a university library in Canada. The classification and subject headings caused and probably still cause some problems in the UBC library system as UBC, as with all academic libraries, uses Library of Congress classification and subject headings. Throughout this, we maintained, protected, 
and studied the classification system and heading and subject headings until she retired in 2015. In the 2000s, new indigenous librarian like Camille Collison, Kim Lawson, Sarah DuPont and Deborah Lee also began to call for current corrected indigenous naming as well as for indigenous subject headings which reflect our subculture and languages. One of the primary institutions in Canada with a great deal of leverage on this is the National Library of Canada. Unfortunately, they have refused to take this up. As reported 11 years ago by librarian Deborah Lee, who is of Cree Mohawk ancestry. Deborah Lee's 2011 paper, Indigenous Knowledge Organization, a study of concepts, terminology, structure, and mostly Indigenous voices. Deborah cites a personal email from the late David Ferris on August 4th. 2009, in which he states that his counterparts at the Library of Congress do not recognize problems with the existing headings as a large enough concern to act on. David Ferris was the editor of Canadian Subject Headings, Standards for the Library and Archives Canada, and he had attempted to bring our concerns to the attention of the Library of Congress. In spite of this rejection by the Library of Congress classification, I strongly believe that this issue should be pursued, especially given that today more and more people that is within many institutions. The proper respectful naming of Indigenous peoples by their own given names is a very basic right as well as a very basic sign of respect. It has been just about 30 years that the Wet'suwet'en legally and officially changed their name back to Wet'suwet'en and stopped using the name carrier. In BC, many First Nations have officially declared the correct spelling of their people's names over two generations ago. The National Library of Canada should realize that their role in Canada's goals of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples could in part be through upholding our Indigenous names and assisting in their recognition. The National Library's responsibility does not begin there as we know that this work requires very detailed research and documentation which should be overseen by First Nations librarians who have cultural knowledge and who also have close community ties to our people. The second topic, which I feel is still outstanding in our profession, is public library services to First Nations and Indigenous Canadians. In 1991, a meeting was called in Vancouver for librarians interested in First Nations services. At first, the focus was on where or how to obtain recommended reading lists created by First Nations. Was to convince the group of another objective. The group's focus immediately changed from what information they could obtain from First Nations such as lists of recommended books, to how could they serve First Nations. Thus began 20 or so years of work of a wonderful network of librarians. I'd like to raise my hands to them in respect and thanks for all their work and their support. They are Nancy Hannum, then head librarian of the Legal Service Society, Anne Doyle, a UBC systems librarian, Marianne Cantillon, a librarian at the Vancouver Public Library, Barb Heineck, a librarian at the Fraser Valley Public Library system, and a Havneet at the BC Public the late Marianne Flipchap, 
who had worked with Department of Indian Affairs and was then working for the city of Richmond. D. Thomas, head of the library at the Native Education Center. Wendy Ansel, who worked for a time at the Department of Indian Affairs and then at the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. Sandy Bradley, a records manager, also joined our group. Except for Guy, who is First Nations, these are all non-Indigenous non librarians from a variety of libraries and archives and who have now retired. While Nancy Hannum graciously and unwaveringly acted as the chair of our committee and represented our group to the Library Association, I often acted as spokesperson at library conferences, etc. Early on, while working with this group, I, I learned something that quite shocked me. That is, that public library services did not extend to people on reserve. While growing up, even though I was a dedicated reader, I did not realize that there was a public library four miles away in Hazleton. At that time, it was common, unfortunately it is still fairly common, for First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities to be very strictly separated from non-Indigenous communities and towns, mostly as a result of racist attitudes. When I moved to Vancouver, I used the public library with great trepidation and rarely as it was such a cold and imposing place. My work and life in the 1970s into the First Nations libraries. And rarely ever did I need to think or use public libraries. Kim, the sixth slide, please. It was shocking to find out that what I was taught in library school about public libraries wasn't true in their relationship to First Nations people on reserve. What I was taught is best described in a UNESCO document on public libraries. This 2001 report of the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions states, the public library is equally available to all members of the community, regardless of race, nationality, age, gender, religion, language, disability, Containment. It is a terrible injustice that First Nations on reserve in many provinces are still not given equitable access to public libraries. So whenever I was given the opportunity, I would speak out on this topic. One such occasion was at a BC Library Association conference workshop held for library trustees in the mid 1990s. This is now a generation and a half ago. I questioned this practice, which was explained away by the fact that reserve lands and First Nations were under the jurisdiction of the federal government, whereas public libraries were under the jurisdiction of the provincial governments and funding for public libraries One of the trustees was kind enough to stand up to clearly state this to me, just in case I still didn't understand the concept. I then reminded him this, that yes, all those taxes and monies were raised in and on the traditional homelands of First Nations, who for millennia owned and governed these lands. In BC, much of the land is unceded but in most other provinces, treaties have been signed. These treaties include the right to education. Public libraries generally consider that one of their primary functions is to support the ongoing educational needs of the public. I think part of the injustice is that First Nations are part of Canada and as such should have equal
for many years, both myself and the BCLA FNIG group made appeals to librarians to develop programs and services for First Nations. Many librarians and library boards have answered these appeals and address this injustice by providing library services to on reserve First Nations without requiring any fees or agreements with Aboriginal governments, as some provincial public library acts now mention or require. However, this service to on reserve First Nations is dependent upon the goodwill of people and goodwill can be lost at any time when personnel changes, budgets change, and library boards change. Therefore, I think it is that their library legislation is not creating inequities and leaving Indigenous peoples unserved or underserved. At least half of our First Nations populations and most Indigenous populations are now urban and living off reserve, where they are needing to be welcomed into public libraries. For various historical, cultural and educational reasons, and as a result of systemic racism, public libraries are not necessarily familiar institutions to Indigenous peoples. And so services and programs that appeal specifically to Indigenous Canadians needs to be offered. In the early 2000s, there were still so few programs to list off on one hand the few that were offering Indigenous programs. Now Indigenous storytelling, Indigenous interns, and other Indigenous programming has almost become a norm. I'm happy to note that not only urban libraries, but small libraries like the Hazelton District Public Library welcome and provide services so that many, including my 93-year-old mother, now use the services of the library. Many public librarians are continuing to develop wonderful and unique programs specifically aimed at drawing and attracting new Indigenous library users. Kim, the seventh, ply, seventh slide, please. The Kith and Kin program at Vancouver Public Library Britannia was developed by Teen Services Librarian Ariel Caldwell of the Britannia branch of Vancouver Public Library. This is a wonderful and unique program working in conjunction with the Indian Residential School Survivors Society and with Library Archives Canada to assist Indigenous people in doing genealogical research. This is especially important now as many of the 60 scoop survivors are beginning to address how and when they were removed from their families and communities. In many cases, it brings peace and closure to people who have been suffering for years. So kudos to librarians like Ariel, who are working to develop increasingly relevant and important programs. of the Presidential School Survivors Society. Careful consideration and respect of past history demands such involvement by our people. The final issue I would like to bring to your attention is the training of First Nations and Indigenous peoples. In BC, the BCLA FNIG group first attempted to answer this in the 1990s by presenting workshops for people working in First Nations collections. We held these workshops with the support of the BC Library Association and Weewa Library. The BCLA FNIG group saved the registration fees from the workshops. And the group also appealed to the BC Library community for donations.
After about five years, these monies were then um, matched under the direction of Joanne Archibald of the First Nations House of Learning. The money was then presented to the UBC School of Library and Archival Sciences to establish a scholarship for First Nations. The interest group and the House of Learning asked me if it could be named the Jean Joseph First Nations Scholarship, which I was honored to accept. This scholarship has supplied some financial support and incentive to now 20 UBC iSchool students, including Camille Callison, Kim Lawson, and Melissa Adams. Last year, Felicity Collins from Cahewin Cree Nation I recall in the mid 1990s going to a BC Library Association conference in the Okanagan. Being novices when it came to lobbying, we thought we could just bring forward a motion, but discovered that we had not gone through the proper procedures. I instead ended up just being able to speak to the floor near the end of the conference. I had little time, so spoke briefly of how training and educational outreach was needed for First Nations to enter our profession. I asked people to look around. The large hotel ballroom was filled to capacity. And when I told them to look around, I pointed out that this was pretty well an entirely homogenous group of people. and certainly no First Nations. I recall looking at people and they looked quite uncomfortable and some even shocked to have this pointed out. I then pointed out that those working in libraries should better reflect the communities they serve. Perhaps that speech helped in a small way to highlight this issue as in 1997, the University of BC School of Library, Archival and Information Sciences initiated the First Nations cur curriculum concentration with the intention of preparing students to work with and within Indigenous communities and in cultural heritage organizations by enabling students to focus on Indigenous information, initiatives and systems including language preservation. Various UBC librarians worked to establish this concentration with a few longtime supporters such as Lois Bewley and Sylvia Crooks, who had taught and worked at the school during my studies, being very active in supporting the establishment of the concentration. Unfortunately, I was not as involved as I would have liked as family life required my attention at that time. That year, I made a difficult decision and resigned my tenured position as a librarian at the University of BC to be able to focus on family and my other responsibilities. The library school's concentration has been primarily based upon and continues to be courses offered by other programs. In the early 2000s, Dr. Lotsey Patterson, a Comanche librarian, came to BC and taught one course at the library school. We still dream that more unique and specific courses may be developed to address Indigenous libraries and archives. Perhaps this generation of library professionals can make this happen. As well, we now have a much larger group of Indigenous librarians to draw upon to develop and teach such courses, or perhaps even a program. I'd like to say thank you to my family and all the people who have supported and encouraged me throughout the years. In most of the first decade of my career, I primarily worked alone with no one to consult or discuss my concerns and problems of organizing 
questions. I have had the support of many First Nation leaders like George Manuel, Neil Starrett, Don Ryan, Dr. Verna Kirkness, Donner, Dr. Joanne Archibald, and Terry Lynn Williams Davidson. I've been blessed to know and work with these people. They are not librarians, and so it was a very happy time and even a relief for me to meet and work with the librarians of the BCLA First Nations Interest Group. I think it is important for me to recognize and mention that many of my supporters and associates in library activism have been non-Indigenous people. Their, contribution, their contributions and support of Indigenous library and archival work and goals and work in small groups like the BCLA FNIG group can be time consuming and sometimes our efforts might feel insignificant. However, I feel that every bit of effort that can count in the long run and every bit of cooperation and support can benefit many people. So don't discount yourself or others in what you or they might con contribute. Kim, the last slide, please. This last image is from the Canadian Federation of Library Associations report by the committee chaired by Camille Collison. In conclusion, I would like to bring to your attention the Canadian Federation of Library Associations response and Commission of Canada in 2000. The Federation of Library Associations in 2016 formed a committee chaired by Camille Collison, a Taltan First Nation librarian. This report gives much more scope and depth to the issues that I have reflected upon today. It provides you with opportunities to improve our profession. Thank you. Over to you, Vivian. Thank you so much, Jean. That was just a fascinating lecture and it's given us so much to think about. Um, you raised so many issues in terms of equitable access to information, the responsibility of public libraries to serve First Nations and reflect First Nations culture, the importance of preserving the First Nations historical record, and the importance of having First Nations librarians of, and information professionals of all kinds to reflect the communities they serve. Um, we're really honored that you shared this history with us and we do have time for some questions uh, that hopefully um, there'll be more coming in the chat. I'll start with the first uh, question from Kirsten. Kirsten asks, uh, could you provide more details about the challenges of having to adapt Western naming systems for Aboriginal naming and subject headings? I also just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that this was such a powerful teaching moment for me. I take for granted my ability to access information using the systems that are familiar to me. Of course, the ways in which Aboriginal and First Nations peoples would search for information would be different. Considering this from an accessibility perspective alone is alarming. Well, some of the problems with the naming is that I think that um, is partly a result of um, I think the rather glacial speed that libraries and the systems work at in um, um, uh, updating uh, and moving along with their um, systems. So from what I understood was that
are going to make wonderful uh, changes in our profession so that changes could be made quickly and update our uh, language easily and such. But from what I gather, there's a lot of resistance to any kind of changes that may change the 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 the, the programs and the uh, rules and uh, databases and mm -hmm. such. So there's a lot of resistance to any kind of change, I think, in that. However, I'd like to bring up that I do know that um, uh, I understood that there was a systems librarian who um, noted that the Pakwakiwak name had not been used and was not being used in their system for subject headings. And so he decided that he would change it from the former Kwakutl to Kwakwakiwak. And he changed it one day. They were just horrified. And they demanded and had him change it back. And I thought, my goodness, this shows how easy and quick a systems librarian can actually change it. It's just the um, it's the uh, the entire system and um, the institution that's has is having difficulty moving. The other pro problem that um, can come around with naming is that some First Nations have not yet um, pro claimed their um, uh, rightful um, traditional names and um, they may still be in the midst of um, developing their orthographies. And so because that is changing, people don't realize that these things change mm -hmm. and can change. Very quickly in around 1982, we started using the term First Nations. And so First Nations are, have been using that since then. And um, it's it's been a, it takes a little bit of while for people to, to um, get used to that name. So it's people trying to change people, trying to change institutions. Mm -hmm. That's the problems that I see. Yeah. And we need support. We need support of librarians to um, get these changes. Like the National Library has to be pushed to, the, um, to understand that we really need to, to update and um, have these names recognized. Every time I see an old name used like Kwakutl when it should be Kwakwak, Um, I'm not from the First Nation, but I, I do understand their position. Thank you, Jean. I have another question for you. Um, thank you so much for this informative presentation. I'm curious if, given your considerable influence within formal librarianship, archives, work, and concomitant institutions, you could share any thoughts you might have about less formal library archives projects, if you're familiar with any, and the relationship they have with those more formal institutions, as well as their role in the current Indigenous Renaissance we're seeing happening today in both culture and law, among much else. That's a lot in that question. So I guess maybe starting with, you know, are you aware or, or have you worked with any less formal um, archives or uh, librarianship uh, in, in First Nations communities? Well, as I, I explained earlier, um, a good more majority of the um, 1990s um, and in 2000 and in this past decade, I worked with um, First Nations, which is not part of the formal library systems in any manner. Mm -hmm. And um, I've not had any problems um, developing and using these systems with First Nations. Um, and I don't think, I think that um, the Huihua Library users um, enjoy and find that, that those systems to be helpful and um, something that they could 
be able to uh, educate the non-Indigenous peoples as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jean. And I'm now just looking at the questions and uh, this is a question that has received a large number of votes. So I'm going to jump to it and then maybe we'll go back and, and get some of the other questions. But this, this question has received a lot of uh, thumbs up. Um, it's my understanding that there are currently 63 MLIS programs in North America, but only eight of them offer any classes in Indigenous knowledge with a ninth in development. How can LIS programs better support Indigenous students and attract Indigenous PhD students and faculty? I'm also troubled that Indigenous librarian job postings often require that candidates do work that could fill more than one role. Thank you. Well, I think um, the schools can certainly assist and attract more Indigenous people to their schools by providing courses and programs, hopefully, to that are um, specifically aimed at um, Indigenous peoples and uh, would include courses that are specifically aimed at um, training people to work for their First Nations or their Indigenous people communities. So that I think is something that can be done more by more of the schools. Mm -hmm. um, just um, also locating and uh, recruiting First Nations uh, librarians and archivists and teach those courses would be useful. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's, I mean, it is to some extent, you know, a, a chicken and egg issue where, you know, you need a critical mass, you know, to, to be able to recruit from. But I know uh, that is something that, uh, and, and Dr. Toes has commented as well, um, you know, library and information schools across Canada are working to increase programming and to create common competencies related to traditional knowledge and Indigenous content. But, you know, it, it is a slow process and it's partly because you know, we haven't had, you know, in every school, you know, leadership from the Indigenous community or the First Nations community to, uh, you know, to work with us. Um, uh, and then, Dr. Toes goes on to note, um, we need our profession to reflect the diversity of our communities. How can we help build engagement with Indigenous communities? Do you have any recommendations? Or this is something I know that here at Dalhousie, we're very keen and uh, committed to doing more in our future. So do you have any advice for us how to make those connections? Well, it's very similar to what I um, have advised public libraries to do. Um, I've advised that the public librarians and I advise the schools as well to make contact with the um, uh, First Nations and Indigenous organizations in their area and uh, to start to locate people who in their area who um, have interest and um, would be supportive of, um, of involvement in the school. And um, at the very least, um, in, uh, speakers, uh, that, that is basically how I started out with um, the UBC Library School and I was invited by um, different um, profs to um, do presentations in their courses mm -hmm. and um, I think that in part may have been one of the reasons why the UBC Library School um, set up the First, Nation, First Nations concentration. Mm -hmm. They recognize that there is a, that this type of um, program does have um, and there is a need and there are people interested in it, but you have to you have to reach out. Yeah, no, I think that's that's excellent advice that, the, you know, we, you know, the schools have to be proactive and make those connections. We can't 
you know, passively wait. Uh, I think that's a an excellent observation. Um, here's another question. Uh, again, you know, thank you for a great presentation. Your work to ensure that Indigenous knowledge is included and respected is remarkable. One of the latest frontiers in this space is environmental data and efforts to ensure traditional ecological knowledge is included in decision making for environmental management, while ensuring we respect knowledge holders and data ownership. Um, what advice do you have for us on engaging in these important conversations around traditional uh, environmental knowledge? Well, once again, that um, of accessing traditional environmental knowledge is another to Indigenous communities in your area. And um, there are many um, chiefs, elders, and spokespeople, um, and people in various disciplines um, Western disciplines who are Indigenous, who are quite willing to um, uh, to make that contact with you. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that you would have to remember is that we probably would not, in a wholesale manner, impart with you all of the traditional knowledge that we have. Um, our, our, the traditional knowledge can sometimes be um, a, a matter of great um, personal or community um, in that um, we may not want to uh, impart to the entire world in, uh, in a re very free manner. We're very concerned at times at how our information is going to be used and by whom it's going to be used. Because as you know, a lot of information can be very skewed and changed from what it was originally intended to um, something else. And we're very greatly offended at times when we know that our information is somehow being monitor monitorized so that money can be made out of it. Mm -hmm. And, and that I know that a lot of Indigenous peoples get very offended by that. Yeah. Thank you, Jean. And I'm just watching our time, so I think we have time for one more question. And I do apologize for all the people who asked excellent questions that we just, you know, we could easily go for, you know, another another hour. But unfortunately, we don't have that luxury. So I will just um, give you one more question. And it's a fairly short one. Uh, it says, as an Indigenous person myself, I've met non-Indigenous people who are surprised that I am a professional. Have you ever been asked about the irony of the connection between an oral history culture and library science? That there seems to be a disconnect. Um, I occasionally have had um, First Nations people um, bring that up to me and um, I remember uh, when we opened up the Huihua Library we had a great event a great gathering of people and uh, one of the elders what are you going to do what are you going to do are you going to put all of our elders up on your shelves <laughs> and uh, I said no I don't think I'll do that but uh, I may want to have re your your information recorded and um, and um, maybe transcribed and brought to us in that manner. Um, a lot of um, books have been developed that are based on First Nations knowledge, and so those are the information that we're going to be using. But a lot of most First Nations people do recognize that that um, we are living in a modern world. And we all participate in this modern world. And as such, we all are recording and we are doing videos and such of all of our elders and uh, using that to help to maintain and continue our traditions. 
as well as we are from a oral tradition. Mm -hmm. We have moved on and we are relying on it, but we are also using um, the written and recorded recording information and technologies of today. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you so very much, Jean. I wish we could all give you a, a big round of applause or a standing ovation, but you'll have to just accept our virtual applause, but thank you so very much. That was just outstanding. And it's now my pleasure to turn to the concluding event uh, of this evening's um, celebration, and that is the presentation of our student award. And I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about Norman Horrocks, for whom uh, this evening is, is named. So as I mentioned at the beginning, the Dalhousie Horrocks Leadership Lecture is a flagship event for our school and is a celebration of leadership in our profession. This event is held in honour of Dr. Norman Horrocks, Order of Canada, for his outstanding leadership in the field of librarianship in North America, Australia and Europe. Over several decades, Dr. Horrocks, who was a former director of our school, the School of Information Management, and Dean of the Faculty of Management here at Dalhousie, pursued a very distinguished career of active involvement in professional associations in the United States, in Cyprus, Australia, um, the United Kingdom, and in Canada. His many contributions, for which he received enormous numbers of local, national and international recognitions have advanced the field and the careers of countless individuals, including many faculty members uh, here at Dalhousie. He was a lifelong friend and supporter of SIM. Tonight's scholarship and lecture is supported by an endowment donated by the many former students, colleagues, friends and admirers of our Dr. Horrocks. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Sarah Horrocks, daughter of the late Norman, whom we are honoring today. Sarah will present the Dalhousie Horrocks uh, Student Leadership Scholarship. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, uh, Dr. Howard, and thank you so much, Dr. Joseph, for your thought provoking discussion this evening. Um, before I present Siobhan with her very well deserved award, I just wanted to take the opportunity to again thank the school for organizing this annual lecture in our father's name. I know several of my family members have tuned in this evening and for that we are grateful that this event is virtual because oftentimes we are not all able to be um, in, in, the, uh, in the room when the lecture is being given. Um, as Dr. Howard mentioned, my dad was um, a, a, the epitome of, of, of a typical librarian. He loved books, he loved reading, um, but most of all, he loved knowledge sharing and he loved people. Um, he uh, often is, is described as a walking social network before uh, Facebook even was, existed. He was able to um, connect two individuals across the room just by virtue of knowing some small, minute, facet of their personality or something that they were interested in and he would connect people like dots wherever he went. Um, what he brought to librarianship was beyond you know the importance of knowledge, knowledge management, retention, uh, was getting that knowledge to the various people and into the communities and for that reason Siobhan with the work that you're doing in the library um, right now and your research I know that um, he would have really been so thrilled to see you receive this honor. So thanks so much again, Dr. Joseph, and congratulations, Siobhan. Thank, thank you, Sarah. Oh, thank you, Sarah and family. Uh, it's really an honor to receive the 2020 Dalhousie Horrocks National Leadership Award. Uh, this support is so meaningful in supporting the field of public librarianship and tonight's lecture was essential, is essential in sharing knowledge so um, and reminding us the work we still need to do. So thank you, Dr. Jean Joseph. Um, it was really, tonight it was very uh, invaluable, all the information you shared with us. 
Um, I work part time as a library assistant with Halifax Public Libraries, uh, which really sparked my interest in going back to school to study uh, to become a librarian. And my work at HPL really provided me insight into some of the issues our community members face, which in turn has greatly influenced my studies. And the financial support from the Horex family and, and the award has enabled me to focus on my research on the opioid crisis and COVID-19. And I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And I hope the research I'm doing will provide insight into best practices and help us, all of us who work with community members. Um, Dalhousie alumni reached out to me to tell me about their experiences with Dr. Horrocks in the classroom and beyond. Um, besides saying he was a hard marker, um, they spoke highly of him and his influence in librarianship. And so I'd really like to thank the Horrocks family um, for sharing his legacy and recognizing the value of public libraries in our communities. So thank you, Sarah, and, and everyone involved in this, this initiative. And now I'm going to turn the screen over to Vivian. Great. Well, congratulations, Javon. And I think um, Sarah is absolutely right. Uh, Norman would have been thrilled to sit down and talk to you about your research. He would have given you endless uh, advice and he would have connected you with all sorts of people across the country that could have helped support your research. So um, I think you're a really worthy recipient of this award. Congratulations and thank you so much Sarah and the Horrocks family for all of your support and for joining us this evening. It's wonderful to be able to remember and honour Norman in this way. And once again, thank you Dr Joseph for such an inspiring presentation. Thank you for our audience for attending this extremely special event. Uh, please do stay in touch with Sim. Our next public lecture will be with our newest faculty member, Dr. Philippe Mongeon on March 18th, and our student research showcase will be coming up on April the 1st. Thanks to COVID, all of these will be virtual events, so people across the country are more than welcome to join us, and details will be posted on the SIM website. Thanks again for coming, everyone. Uh, please have a very good evening and stay in touch. Bye now.